Hello, in this video we'll talk about immunofluorescence and its clinical application. Immunofluorescence is a technique that is widely used in biomedical research and in clinical settings for disease diagnosis. Today's focus would be how immunofluorescence can be used in clinical settings for several disease diagnoses. In this video we'll look at the principle of immunofluorescence, the direct and indirect immunofluorescence assay. Step by step I would walk you through the procedure and we would try to understand how this procedure can be used for disease detection. So stay tuned till the end of this video. Immunofluorescence is based on antigen-antibody interaction. Antigen binds with antibody with several non-covalent interactions like hydrogen bond, ionic bond, hydrophobic interaction, etc. Let me tell you that there are two variants of this immunofluorescence, direct immunofluorescence and indirect immunofluorescence. In direct immunofluorescence, a usage of single antibody is preferred, which detects the target. Now, in indirect immunofluorescence, two antibodies are used, one unconjugated primary antibody and a conjugated secondary antibody. Very often, the unconjugated antibody comes from patient samples. Now let's move to a laboratory setting to understand how immunofluorescence is performed. First step of the immunofluorescence is to fix the sample using 4% paraformaldehyde. Then permeabilization is done in presence of some kind of detergent like Triton X100 which permeabilizes the membrane and ensures the antibody can get inside the cell and detect the antigens. Now the next step is antigen retrieval which is optional but antigen retrieval is crucial because many of the time the epitopes are hidden inside the native structure of the protein that's why antibody cannot recognize the epitopes. So these epitopes need to be revealed by changing of temperature and pH such that the antibody can easily detect the epitope. And that is why antigen retrieval is performed many a cases. Now next step is to perform blocking. Blocking is often done with horse or lamb serum. And the key goal of blocking is to reduce the chances of non-specific binding and it would promote the specific binding. Ultimately, primary antibody incubation is performed. And in this step, Antibodies are added on the slide generally using a liquid blocker, a particular mark is uh, drawn and the antibodies are added. This step is performed overnight in general and at this point of time the primary antibodies should be binding to the antigen. The primary antibody can come from patient sample in clinical setting or in biomedical research Scientists create monoclonal antibodies against specific protein of interest. If you want to know how monoclonal antibodies are generated using hybridoma technology, you can click on the I button. After primary antibody incubation, unbound antibodies are removed by washing these several times. Next, secondary antibody incubation is performed and in this step, fluorophore conjugated secondary antibodies are added. These fluorophore conjugated antibodies detect the FC region of the primary antibody. Since these fluorophores are light sensitive, it is preferred in a dark setting. Now, we need to understand that fluorescence based detection is only one type of detection where fluorophore conjugated antibodies are used. There could be colorimetric detection as well where enzyme linked antibodies are used and in clinical settings, Conjugated antibodies are really useful. Anyway, after secondary antibody incubation, washing should be done to remove all the unnecessary signals or tissue debris, etc. Ultimately, the slides are mounted with cover slip and they are ready to detect under a fluorescence microscope. Let us take some example of direct and indirect immunofluorescence in terms of clinical setting. Pemphigus vulgaris is an autoimmune disease where blistering of the skin or the mucosal membrane takes place and this particular disease can be diagnosed with the help of direct immunofluorescence. So a perilusional tissue is taken on a slide and it can be demonstrated that this particular uh, tissue 
is positive for IgG or IgM and these antibodies are deposited on the intercellular spaces. That is why there would be honeycomb maze like pattern. Another example for indirect immunofluorescence come from the detection of systemic lupus erythematosus using anti-nuclear antigen test or ANA test where the patient sample is collected and the antibodies are incubated with HEP2 cell lines. HEP2 cell lines are important because it is an array of nuclear antigens. So there could be two scenarios. One, patient's blood sample has anti-nuclear antibodies present and anti-nuclear antibodies could be absent in the patient sample. So if the anti-nuclear antibodies are pr present in the patient sample, then we would get immunofluorescence. Otherwise, we won't get an immunofluorescence. Looking at the immunofluorescence pattern, a doctor can understand whether it is positive or not. And there are several characteristic patterns on which several interpretations can be taken. And in this video, we are not going to talk about this particular aspect in details, but using immunofluorescence, this particular disease can be diagnosed. Now, just like we have seen for systemic lupus, these are the immunofluorescence pattern for bolus pemphigoid and pemphigus vulgaris. So, in short, we understood that immunofluorescence pattern can aid in disease diagnosis. So, in summary, I would like to say we talked about the principle of immunofluorescence, direct and Im indirect immunofluorescence, clinical and biomedical applications of immunofluorescence. So if you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. You can support my channel in Patreon. You can also support me via Veeam UPI app. Indian viewers can support me via that. Your support means a lot to me. You can take my courses in Anacademy using my code AP10 can give you 10% discount. Thank you.